About 83% of you guys are not subscribed. Subscribing, clicking that like button, and commenting all help me out a lot in doing what I really want to do. Thank you guys so much for all your support. What is going on guys? Rogue TCG here is the long awaited updated Orcist deck profile. This is going to be for the newest ban list, the one that was recently in the April season, like the very beginning. So this is going to be Orcus. There are a couple slight changes because we did have one hit on the list and one unhit on the list. So I'm gonna walk you through the list card by card. And then right after I'm gonna toss you over to the digital version of myself, even though you can see me in the corner right here. Hi. I'm gonna to toss you over online so we can walk through our combos and go really in depth on this video. There will be timestamps on the whole video. So if you just wanna see the combos and the basic tutorials, feel free to skip ahead. They'll be on the, um, during the video timeline, I believe. But that's not the happen for me. Let's get into the profile. Starting off our main deck, we are on triple of the goodest boy. We're on triple Gearsu the Orcus Mech Knight on normal or special. You can dump an Orcus for a world legacy card, and if he's the only monster you control on ignition, you can make a token for each player. That's a level one token. Before, that was full combo because we could go into Link Karibo and then Galatea, but now we need to play Link Spider because it's the only Link one that can use a token. So we are forced to play one Link Spider in the extra deck in order to let Gearsu do our one card combo and utilize that token to its fullest. Next, we are on Double Orcus Nightmare. We can activate the effect in the graveyard to banish it from the graveyard, target a monster on the field, and then send a dark machine from our deck to the graveyard, and then give the monster we targeted stats equal to the level times 100. So, not the worst. Uh, if it is a quick effect due to Babel, we can do it during the damage step since it does modulate damage and numbers, which is incredibly strong in order to protect our bot uh, monsters. And also, a lot of people just straight up forget about it. In our basic combo, we always end on Nightmare in the Graveyard to protect whatever is on our field. So sometimes our opponents, they think that they see the IP Masquerina that we end on and they go, okay, I'm going to swing over with a 1500 attack monster. And we can go Nightmare, send World 1, there's another 800 on IP and it wins battle. So we are playing two Nightmare because we also do want to see as many Orcus as possible since we are on the Cartesia version. We are on two Orcus Nightmare, finally at three. However, we're only gonna be playing two. Three is more of something that I believe Sky Striker Orcus is gonna be playing just because of orchestrated return. However, we're only on one return, so two Harp Horror is fine. As long as one is maintained in deck, we can always send it to the graveyard with our Nightmare. And for our last two of on the Orcus, we are on two Symbol Skeleton. We can banish from our graveyard, target an Orcus monster in our graveyard and special summon it, and then However, all these Orcus monsters, uh, Nightmare Forward, uh, all the ones that activate the effects in the graveyard are going to Dark Lock us for the rest of the turn after we use the effects. So we have to summon all our lights beforehand. For our final actual Orcus, we're on one Ass Bombard. I really was tempted to cut this now that Link Karibo is banned. However, I just find it so invaluable, especially when playing against um, sort of anti-meta strategies like stuff that plays Dimensional Shifter, because Brass Bombard is just crazy. Same with Gearsu. Gearsu is really good under Dimensional Shifter. It lets you set up um, the Counter Trap, and I'll show you how to do that. So, and then our last Orcist, Honorary Orcist, is World Legacy World Wong. We can send this to the graveyard with Gearsu or with Nightmare, and when you can banish it from the graveyard, target a banished uh, Orcist monster, and then special summon it. Not just our um, main deck monsters, we can summon our extra deck monsters too. So, it is always not an awful thing to just banish them. If your opponent called by the grave your Galatea, bring it back. Who cares? Slap a ding gears you on top of it. Put the world wand underneath. Pretty decent. Um, so those are our monsters for Orcists. Now for our spell traps. We are on one orchestrated return. We get to pitch an orchestral world legacy for cost and then draw two. Very strong getting those stuff and uh, those things in the graveyard as cost. So really, if they negate it, we're just fishing out a negate for the most part. We are on one. Orcist Crescendo, if you control an Orcus Link monster, it's a counter trap that banishes the card, as well as in the graveyard, other than the turn we activated it, we can banish it to add a Dark Machine from deck to hand, and then we're locked into Dark Machines that entire turn that we do that. So, it's a little bit of a really restrictive um, lock, however, it can get us out of pickles because it can search Gear Sue from deck to hand. And then for our last, but the best Orcist spell trap, in my opinion, is Orchestrated Babble making all of our Orcus quick effects, uh, which is insane. Uh, it makes all of our Orcus, which are already pretty decent without being quick effects, insane with quick effects. If we can manage to maintain this on board and use all our Orcus on our opponent's turn, 
the likelihood of us winning that game goes from like about 50% to about 70%. Because just the fact we can outgrind and get so many resources from our deck is just absolutely insane. And the value that we're getting off of the Babel and all of our Orcus is, again, also insane. So I think this is always the best pick to be grabbing off of Galatea. That's the end of our Orcus portion of our deck. Now onto our Cartesia. We're on triple blazing Cartesia the Virtuous. It has a clause on it that can special summon itself. However, we're never really going to be doing that. Uh, we're just going to be normal summoning it. And then we can quick effect fuse using cards from our hand or field. It is only during the main phase, but it is a quick effect. So we can dodge interaction if your opponent doesn't read it. It also allows you, if it gets negated on your first turn, we can just keep it on board and do it on our opponent's turn. So it's a quick, quick effect. And then also has the effect, in the, if it's in the graveyard, uh, and there's a fusion monster was sent to the graveyard the turn that it was in the graveyard, you get to add it back to hand at end phase. The fusion monster does not have to retain itself in graveyard. You can send it to graveyard and then banish it and then send Cartesia and it'll just, it'll know. So, triple Cartesia, really strong, best 1.5 combo in the deck. This plus any lighter dark does send an Orcus Nightmare from deck to graveyard, which gets the entire combo started. In order to search our Cartesia, in order to, and also to dump more Orcus, we're on triple branded in high spirit, allowing us to pitch any machine monster in our deck to add a Cartesia from deck to hand. We can also pitch any spellcaster in our deck to add a Cartesia from deck to hand. And almost all of our cards are either machines or spellcasters or lights or darks. So every single card in our deck can function for some part of Cartesia's combo. So that's our Cartesia engine. We are running a very small Bestial package we did downsize it just a little bit we're on one bestial lubelion as well as the one magnamut it searches and then the one other searcher for lubelion is branded regained regained is crazy in orcus it just lets you infinitely recycle your orcus and if your opponent does not get rid of regained even if you have like a bestial in graveyard you're just getting so much advantage off the combination of regained the bestials and the orcus that that game is just won almost flat out unless they can just otk you instantly but orcus are also really good at just not getting otk'd for the most part unless they can really abuse galatea not being able to destroy by battle that's it for our engine cards now for our non-engine let's start with our hand traps we are on 11 of them we are on triple infinite impermanence pretty standard we're on Triple Effect Veiler. It's a light spellcaster, so we can search Cartesia and fuse with Cartesia. We're on Triple Droll and Lockbird. It is a spellcaster, so we can search Cartesia with it. And then lastly, we are on Double Fantastical Dragon Phantasme. I really, really like this card in this format uh, with all the Link Summoning going on. Being able to basically get a free fix of your hand and having um, spot um, targeted negation. So if something targets one of your cards, you can discard a card to negate it. Discarding, also great with the Orcists. So I believe this card is just so incredibly powerful. We can search it off Bestial Magnemut in the end phase, so it is searchable somewhat. So we are playing two of it. But those are our hand traps, and I saw at 11 if we're not counting our Bestial Magnemut. And now for the last portion of our deck, we are on non-engine. For our non-engine cards, we are on Double Forbidden Droppy in order to just negate boards. It's good interaction too. We are on double Book of Moon. We did downsize from two to one in order to fit the other Harp Horror in the list. And then for our last one ofs, we are on one Called by the Grave and one Foolish Burial. The reason we're running Book of Moon, I'm gonna go over it quite a bit later, but it is really powerful in this deck specifically because we can Book of Moon the Cartesia in order to dodge stuff like Effect Veiler and Infinite Impermanence, and it's really, really good interaction, in my opinion, for the Snake Eye matchup. And on most matchups, too. Most decks aren't prepared for their cards to be flipped face down. That's um, what I'm thinking. The only deck that it doesn't hurt at all is, like, Branded. So, it even does. You can flip the Quem. So, that's, like, fine. Um, but that is the main deck. Now, let's go on to our extra deck. In our extra deck, we are running two Link ones this time. We are running one Relinquished Anima. This is to be used with Effect Veiler, Drone Lockbird, and Orcus Brass Bombard. We are running seven different cards in the deck that can translate into an Anima. It is pretty decent interaction, especially if we're going second and we normal summon a Brass Bombard. It's quite strong. 
Uh, Anima is also a dark, so it plays under our Orcist lock, so it is quite nice for that. So we are just playing this as the Link Karibo replacement. It's primarily for uh, Brass Bombard, however, just to get it off field so we can use the graveyard effect. And then for our other Link one, I did mention it earlier in the profile. We are running that one Link Spider. Uh, there's only one card that we use tokens for, and that is exactly Gearsu. However, it is just so necessary in order to have that Link Spider for that Gearsu. It also works for the Nibiru token if we're not dark locked by that point, but Link Spider is quite important in my opinion. So we are just running that one of, and in order to fit that in, we did cut the Nightmare Unicorn in our extra deck. For Link 2s, we're on one Dark, the Dark Charmer Gloomy in order to extend further using our opponent's graveyard stuff, and we're a dark deck, so it's really easy to go into Long Gear Suit into access code like that. And then we are on the Lesbians, one SP Little Knight and one IP Masquerade. I keep on putting them in the wrong area, my bad. Uh, really, really powerful things. Uh, we're typically ending on an IP Masquerade. This is our primary end board, is IP Masquerade, Babel, maybe like one set in our full graveyard. And then we have SP a Little Knight in order to break boards and to just be an incredibly strong card. For our Orcist, we are on double Galatea, the Orcist Automaton. We are able to target a banished uh, machine monster in our banishment. Not just Orcist, we can, if we banish our Sprite Sprint, we are able to put that back in as well. So if we have a banished Orcist, uh, we can put it back in deck and then we can choose uh, to set a spell trap, an Orcist spell trap, from deck to field so it plays around Droll. We can set Babel, the Crescendo, or the Draw spell. So typically we're gonna be grabbing Babel, but if we open Babel, we do primarily wanna be focusing on that Crescendo if we do have the combo past that. If we don't have combo, then we can grab Return. But the most important thing to get online, always turn one, is Babel. So we are playing two Galatea, just cause we can go into it. And also, if this card is linked, meaning if a link monster is either pointing to it or it's pointing to something, this card can't be destroyed by Babel. A lot of people don't know that. There's that. If we're playing one long gear suit, people know this one even less. We can um, we can put two banished machines back into our deck, and then we have an option to send a linked monster our opponent controls to the graveyard. Uh, again, it's any card that this points to or something is pointing to. Uh, so it's really easy for your opponent to accidentally like link a really important monster they need on field. So it's really easy to send that card to graveyard non-targeting. Really strong, another non-targeting send on long gear suit. As well as this guy has the effect, if he is linked, he can't be destroyed by card effects, uh, which a lot of people just don't know, which is really funny. So we are playing the one long gear suits, our only link three. And then for our link four, we are on one accessing the code talker for OTKs and getting rid of board states, especially now that we are playing our link spider. It does increase the ceiling of access code being a pop two cards now. Woohoo! For our XCs, we are on double Dean Gear Suit because it does come up running two. We do want to be running two, especially so it doesn't get ripped out of our extra deck with, I don't know, a Cash Tier Unicorn or something. We always have that second one available to us. Really strong, being able to send a card on field non-targeting when it's summoned, or being able to attach a banished machine monster to itself. Really, really strong stuff. So we are going to play two of that. And then for our fusions, this is our Brandon High Spirit target for machines. We're on one sprint. Doesn't do fuck all in the deck, except it's a card we sent to the graveyard. We're in double Grand Guggenol, the Dust Dragon. This is the card that sends Nightmare to graveyard. Or we can also send World Wand or Lubelion to graveyard too. Those are also good picks. Um, Grand Guggenol is incredibly strong. It is also interaction by itself. If we link it off on our opponent's turn, we can banish it from the graveyard if they summon something using an activated monster effect. Really strong stuff against, especially against Snake Eye with their Poplar. Their Poplar activates in hand and summons itself. So that just gives us a free activation, almost guaranteed against that deck of Grand Guggenol and Graveyard to get a, the, our next monster out. But this is also a Spellcaster. So this is also a um, very similar to Sprint where we can send one of these to the Graveyard off of High Spirits in order to search a Cartesia if need be. And then our card that we search, I mean not search, the card that we cheat out of our extra deck with Grand Guggenol is Despian Proskinian, an incredibly strong card that if your opponents are not ready for it, will fucking mow them. Uh, this card is a 32-32. We're never gonna be summoning it the right way. And during the main phase, quick effect, you can target a monster summoned from the extra deck in your opponent's graveyard. So Link, Synchro, Xyz, Fusion. You can target one of those in your, in your opponent's graveyard. Quick effect during the main phase, special summon it to your field or banish it. Uh, really strong stuff. Banish the Promethean Princess, 
banish the Amblo Whale, banish the IP Mascarena, or even what's even better than banishing the IP Mascarena, summon it to your side of the field so you can use it. Uh, incredibly strong stuff, and it also has the effect where if it destroys a monster by battle, you get to do damage to your opponent equal to whatever the highest stat on that monster was. Um, that's nice. Uh, it really lets us OTK really easily, and if we do open our Cartesia line, this card is going to be on the field more times than not. But that is the main and the extra. I'm just going to cover the side real quick because the side is also always going to be a uh, local metagame determinative. We are on that one anti-spell fragrance because it is at one. We're on two twin twister for back row removal. We're on two evenly matched for when we're going second and as well as back row removal. For our monster side of our side deck, we are on one Jizzy Cummy, the Star Destroying Kaiju. Really good to slap that on top of an Amblo Whale or some big unkillable dickhead. Two Bestials, one Baldric and one Druis Worm in case we go against a dark or a light deck. We're on three Skullmeisters. This one's primarily for Snake Eye as well as Labyrinth in order to get that transaction rollback from the graveyard or to get that Flamberge from the graveyard. So we are on the Skullmeisters for that. And then lastly, we are on Triple Nibiru, the Primal Being, just because it's an incredibly good card. And if we go against a deck that loses against it, we can just easy side it in. And again, our side deck does also play with our Cartesia. We're on a Light Machine, so this can search and fuse Cartesia. We're on two Dark Dragons. We just can't search Cartesia, but they can both be fused into it. We're on Dark Fiends with Skullmeister, so again, can only be fused into it. And then Nibiru, Light, a Rock, only can be fused into it. But they're all usable with Cartesia. So, um, that is the full deck profile, and then I'm going to toss you over to the Digital Realm in order to talk about the deck some more. So, I'm going to toss you right over there. One, alrighty. So, we are back. Um, we are in the Digital Realm now, and here is the list. Uh, it's the exact same list I just went over with you guys. It's the exact same list card for card. Uh, except now it's just digital so you can see all the cards individually so you can see we have 11 orcas monsters three orcas spell traps artesia rounds out the first 20 then we have bestials hand traps so basically the second half of the list is kind of non-engine ish well the first half is all our engine um i did the math and in our opening hand for our cartesia engine we have about a 50 percent chance about 57 percent chance of seeing it in our opener and for Gear Suit or Cartesia, for any of our starter cards, we have an 87% chance of finding it. For opening two hand traps, we have about a 47% chance of opening two different hand traps. So there is always going to be that. Um, but of course, those are just the numbers. Those are just the basic statistics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a bunch of games. You're, I'm going to show you guys. How many of the hands are able to make a combo which means getting either a nightmare um orcus nightmare or a orcus harp or in the graveyard is full combo as long as there's a monster on field for nightmare um or you know sometimes just some hands aren't going to combo so i'm just going to drag you over it's just going to be a small little montage i'll speed it up for you guys but it's just going to be just me testing for a little bit and then i'm going to talk about it afterwards
Alrighty, so after that montage, you saw that most of the hands actually did do the combo. It was about a nice, like, solid 75% to 80%. Most hands did some sort of thing, or at least set up some sort of slower combo turn, like normally in Cartesia and getting a Cartesia back during the end phase, in order to go in on the quick effect on our opponent's main phase to make Grand Guggenol, which is in itself an interaction point. So technically we're not ending on nothing, however it's a lot less impactful for what we could be ending on with our Orcus stuff. However, I do believe that's just the nature of the deck. Of course, the only or only two Orcus that actually do anything when we draw them without a uh, return is uh, Gear Suit or Ass Bombard. Every other Orcus, we need to either open high spirits or return in order to really do anything with it. Of course, Droplet also works for this function. Um, it's the reason it's in the deck. It's really good at going second, and it's really great at getting Orcus out of our hand. Um, but let's talk about specific cards now. The reason we are playing um, the reason we are playing Book of Moon specifically is because Cartesia is one of the critical choke points of the deck. You saw in our combo tutorials how most of the times when we started our combo, we didn't start with Gearsu if we had the option. We started with Cartesia because we knew if we start with Cartesia, we're going to summon the Gearsu along the lines of the combo. Cartesia is a lot more difficult to interact with than Gearsu is. Gearsu, you can Ash Blossom it, Effect Failure it, Ghost. Um, you can't ghost bell it, unfortunately. I was thinking a ghost ogre it. Um, you can do all of those different things to gear suit. But with Cartesia, you can only go ghost ogre. You can only go... Um, you can only go Valor and you can only go Imperm. At least for Valor and Imperm, the ones that people are playing, we do have Book of Moon in the deck in order to flip our Cartesia face down since fusioning still works with face down materials. You did also, might you might have seen in our combo tutorials how... Most of the time, if we had open two different Cartesias or a way to get to another Cartesia, we would normal summon a Cartesia and fuse using materials from our hand instead of the Cartesia on field. That's because we still get that Cartesia from the hand back during the end phase of the turn, as well as now we're keeping a Cartesia up so we can go into a second Grand Guggenol on our opponent's turn in order to dump something like Abyssu Lubellion. Maybe if we fucked up and we didn't get a Nightmare back in rotation. Or maybe we just want a World Wand, although World Wand's much better being set with Nightmare. We can do that. So this deck also does have that like secondary layer of just, if the Orcus stuff doesn't work out, sometimes Grand Guggenol is just a good enough card. Summoning Pro Skinion with just non-engine, like Droll, Valor, Droplet and stuff, is sometimes just good enough. Um, for hand trap wise, the reason we are playing this is because I believe these are the hand traps that best uh, stop the current meta. Phantasma is here for decks like Snake Eyes, decks that just keep linking. It helps us get these Orcus out of our hand, deep brick, and it protects us against stuff like SP Little Knight. It's also searchable with Bestial Magnemut since it's a dragon, so if we go first, we can search Phantasma in the end phase, which is quite nice in order to get a guaranteed piece of interaction. But Phantasmate is quite good because it's also a dragon. If we summon it, we can also bring out Lubellion using it. But main thing is it also protects our field. If we can get it on board, it protects our field from targeting by discarding a card. Cards that every single card in our deck kind of wants to get discarded by default anyway. Specifically the Orcus, of course. But if we're able to discard cards in order to protect our cards from targeting, which is very, very strong. Um... This list actually is also pretty much in completely legal and master duel as well. Uh, the only thing is you'd want to put max C in here instead of like infinite impermanence, I believe. As well as since there is Link Karibo in master duel, you take out Link Spider and Anima, put in a, a Link Karibo, and then you could put in a Nightmare Unicorn or something like that. And instead of SP Little Knight, you go Sky Striker Ace Azalea. This is also a good budget option for any of you... Uh, Oh, it's all one word. Oops. This is also a very good budget option for any of you guys who are a little bit strapped on cash and can't afford an SP. Sky Striker Ace Azalea is basically SP at home. Uh, it needs a light or an or dark monster. So, yes, it does need something kind of specific. Uh, it must be a link summon. You can only summon it once per turn. And if it's special summon, you get a pop a card on field. And then you have to pop itself if you don't have three or more spells in your graveyard. We're most likely not going to have those spells in the graveyard. However, just a thing that we can go into IP Masquerina to do a quick effect pop on something is functionally just SP like at its baseline level. So this is an option that you could run if you were really hurting for an SP at home. 
You might be wondering why we are running such a strange hand trap lineup. Um, that's because everything but four cards in our deck uh, will work with our Blazing Cartesia. And I'm just saying four cards by finding the Blazing Cartesia for Brandon High Spirits. All but four cards are Brandon High Spirits targets to find Cartesia. Every single card but three targets in the deck are cards that confuse using Blazing Cartesia. So the targets for the tar cards that aren't targets for Brandon High Spirits are our dragons, being Fisty Lubellion, Magnema, and our Double Phantasmize. Because we don't have a dragon um, fusion monster in here, and we can't really fit one, unfortunately. However, um, for our fusion materials, the three that don't work are, of course, Triple Droll and Lockbird, because they're winds, which is the main issue with this card, in my opinion. It's a wind monster. It's kind of frustrating. However, it is still just an incredibly strong card because our card, our deck does not really add cards from deck to hand. So we can play it really safely without having to worry about it affecting us like at all. Because if you look at our deck, we only have three cards that add cards from deck to hand, maybe four. We have our Brandon High Spirits. It's a quick, uh, quick play, so we can do it in our draw phase. So never going to trigger Droll functionally. We have Orchestrated Return, which can trigger Droll, however... Typically, by that time, we've already gotten max value out of it by setting an Orchest from uh, hand to graveyard and drawing some cards, so not really too concerned about that. We have Branded Regained, which is like the most mid-droll target ever because we're just drawing a singular card for putting a card back, and we still do get to put the card back, I believe. Uh, actually, we, we might not, you know, I'm not going to look into that exactly right now. Uh, but if you're going to draw a single draw, then sure. And then lastly, we do have our Lubellion and our Magnemut that do technically do that. Technically, our Phantasma is in there, but we're only really going to be summoning this on our opponent's turn unless they go IP Mascarena on our turn. So we're pretty resilient to Droll and Lockbird, to be honest. And most people, if they do, if you do go against this deck, side out Droll. It doesn't do much. Uh, Effect Veiler, of course, really great card. One of the also one of the main issues I did find with this deck is um, it has a really weird matchup into gr banished dot decks like stuff with dimensional sh shifter macro cosmos stuff like that because the deck the archetype naturally has great ways to get rid of it I mean we have Dengirsu we have uh, like we have big guys that can like kind of deal with that sort of stuff uh, but our hand traps don't like. Our Droll and Lockbirds and our Effect Veilers, they have to go to Graveyard to activate. So they're completely dead under those cards. So that's one of the main issues. But of course we can side them out for, you know, proper side deck stuff. We'd probably side them out for Twin Twisters and an Anti-Spell. Maybe a Jizzy Kiro. But uh, cards that do work really well under Shifter is Lubellion Magnemut. Uh, Lubellion can search the Magnemut and then Magnemut can banish the Shifter to summon itself to grab a Phantasmia to get a body on board. Gearsu is also very strong against uh, Dimensional Shifter, funny enough. We can go Normal Summon, Gearsu, Gearsu Effect, Descend, and Orcus that we don't care for. Or we don't even have to use the effect to play around like stuff like Ash. We can go Gearsu, Gearsu's uh, Ignition Effect to make a token for each player. Go Token into Link Spider, Link Spider and Gearsu into Galatea. Because Dimensional Shifter is on the board... Uh, our Gearsu is going to get banished, which allows us to go Galatea, target that Gearsu that's banished to put it back in deck to set an Orcus Crescendo, giving us a counter trap as well as a Galatea chilling on board. And we could honestly just turn into a Ding Gearsu as well. We get to put that Gearsu back in deck so we have full Gearsu's live in deck, uh, which I am going to talk about in just a moment is managing your Orcus's. Uh, I think that's one of the major skill uh, issues with the deck is Orcus management. Um, but it does put your gear suit back, and that is how you play around Dimensional Shifter. Now let's talk about Orcus management. With our Orcus, we do have an order of effects we'd like to do with them. We have our Nightmare, which can send a Dark Machine from deck to graveyard for a stat buff on one of our monsters. We have Harpoard that can special summon an Orcus from our deck by banishing itself. We have Symbol Skeleton that can summon an Orcus from Graveyard. We have Brass that can summon an Orcus from Hand. And we have World One that can summon an Orcus from Banishment. So what is the order of operations we want to be doing this in? Our Cartesia, uh, our Grand Guggenol and Cartesia basically say that we have to start with our Orcus Nightmare. Because that sends Orcus Nightmare to the Graveyard. Or it can send World One if we have already gotten Nightmare into Graveyard. 
Our gear suit says we have to start with our Orcist Harpoor. Well, which because we send Harpoor off of the gear suit because it's the most value in one individual card being able to summon an Orcus Nightmare from deck is incredibly strong. So that's what we send when we normal summon gear suit. But when are we going to be sending Orcus Symbol Skeleton? When do we send World One? You know, those are the big questions. What I have found is typically we do not want to be starting with sending Symbol Skeleton to the graveyard. Symbol Skeleton is a card you want to get in graveyard during your opponent's turn. Not during your turn necessarily, unless you open really high roll. You, but you do not want to be using it during your turn. Because this is a card that retains so much more value in the late game rather than the early game. In the early game, this card gets minimal value, especially due to cards like Nibiru the Primal Being and Board Breakers. But in the late game, being able to have all your Orcus Symbol Skeletons in rotation really helps you get that edge off against your opponent and really outgrind them. So I personally prefer sending my symbol skeletons to the graveyard turn two to bring back the Dingirsu or even the Galatea. Because if we bring back our Galatea turn two instead of Dingirsu, let's say they're not really threatening us, we bring back the Galatea. During their end phase on the quick effect, we could set an Orcus Crescendo from our deck to our field to insulate our OTK next turn. So there is always that. Now you might be asking, why do I think that this deck is good and why do i think that it's actually going to be a threat in the upcoming meta i feel like this deck has a very unique position in the local meta game where it can grind almost to infinitum as well as being able to uh put up blockers and not die on that first turn this deck is really good at just not dying putting up really weird niche forms of interaction that your opponent doesn't quite see immediately but they are there. I mean, after all, our end board is literally standardized, orchestrated Babel. We have an IP Mascarena on field, maybe a back row or two that we drew, but we're not gonna talk about that. So we have Babel, IP Mascarena. We have a Dingirsu in grave, a Galatea in grave, a Farpoor in grave, and a Nightmare in grave. What do all those things in represent? IP Mascarena means the possibility of going into either a long gear suit or an SP Little Knight. Maybe worst case scenario, an access code talker or a dark if we get like dark hold at the very start of the turn. Um, it also does grant that uh, protection. So we, we could also make Galatea if we wanted a Galatea that can't be destroyed by card effects and then uh, could also not be destroyed by battle if it's pointing to something. So that's something that we can also do. However, so that's just the IP Mascarena. Then we have our uh, Nightmare that has the ability to not only send our symbol skeleton to the graveyard in order to bring back the Dingirsu to send a card from field to graveyard or to attach a card from banishment to itself to protect your field. But Nightmare can also function during the damage step because Babel gives it a quick effect and this card has an effect that modulates stats. So we can use this during the damage step. For example, if our opponent normal summons something that's let's say 1500 attack and we have an IP Mascarena on board, they go to combat the moment they normal summon it. We say, that's all right. They move to combat, they swing during damage calc, we activate our Orcus Nightmare. And remember how I said we don't want to be sending World Wand off of Grand Guggenol unless we can get it back really? Well, that's why, because we want to use Orcus Nightmare to send our a World Wand, which is a level eight, buffing our IP Mascarena by 800, putting it to 1600. We can do the exact same thing to our Dingirsu, buffing to 3400, getting over nice 3300 attack big boys, which is really, really helpful. Another thing with this deck is we all that, and we still had our Orcist Harpoor, which we were able to summon our Girsu to dump anything else in our entire like Orcist lineup that we could want. If we didn't have the opportunity to go Nightmare, we could dump another Harpoor for our next turn. We could dump another symbol skeleton if we've already used that first one so we can get that recursion for next turn. If we had to dump a symbol skeleton with our nightmare, then we can dump a world wand. So you see, we do have lots and lots of different options. If our orchestrated babble ever gets removed, we can send a card from our hand to the graveyard in the next turn to add it to, from our graveyard to our hand so we can get it back. So the best way people can remove this outright is to banish it. But most people aren't really going to be doing that because we're not playing Fire King. Now let's discuss the difference between opening with Girsu and opening with Cartesia, because that's probably going to be something that people are going to want to know about. 
Technically speaking, the, the orcist portion of the end boards are exactly the same. The, both end boards end with an IP mask Reina, a Babel, a night, orcist nightmare and graveyard, and an orcist harp horror and graveyard. The main difference is the fact that typically the Gearsu one uh, has less stuff in graveyard at the very end of it and is easier to interrupt. Um, however, the Cartesia one has differing interactions. Uh, it doesn't dark lock us as quickly, as well as it uses an intermediate card being Grand Guggenol in order to send the Orcus Nightmare instead of making a token. Because we're using Grand Guggenol, this card is also interaction from the graveyard, so we can feel free to link it off. And if we do link it off, that means we get our Cartesia, our starter card, back to our hand. Which Gearsu doesn't do that. Gearsu is a one and done and we only have three in the deck. Typically it's pretty difficult to put them back in deck because we have to banish them somehow. Either with uh, a bestial or with some other type of banishment related effect. So it's a little bit difficult to recycle those used Gearsus off of Harpoor comparative to any of the other Orcus because it doesn't banish itself for any of its graveyard effects. Which means we can't recycle it with Long Gearsu or Galatea typically speaking. But with Cartesia... We can recycle Grand Guggenol with stuff like Branded Regained, being able to put it back so we can continuously use it over and over again. That's also the reason we're playing two of them, and we're playing three Cartesia. So if we do open the Cartesia, we can make one on one turn and one on another turn. Or we can send one to the graveyard for Branded High Spirits for Effect Veil or Droll or Cartesia to grab another Cartesia. So playing two, I do think, is optimal. It might honestly even be correct to run three in certain scenarios if you're really feeling the pressure but technically speaking the cartesia engine does end on a higher uh, strength end board because you do get the despian proskinian which is a quick effect graveyard steel which is quite strong or if you choose to build the other version of the deck we do have our despian lulu Lilith, which is a negate so we do have varying forms of interaction that we can pull out of our fucking asshole in order to screw over our opponents. Now let's talk about meta decks. I want to talk specifically to you all about Snake Eyes right now. And then I'm going to talk about Labyrinth right afterwards. Because they're the two decks that I have built this deck in order to compete against. For Snake Eye, all of our hand traps are great against them. Our Bestial Magnemut is able to banish their IP Masquerina from the graveyard when they link it off to make Promethean Princess. And when they can activate the Bestial in response to their um, Flamberge in order to set their IP Masquerina back to their back row. It's also a great card for getting rid of Diabell Star from their graveyard as well. Uh, Phantasma is really great because the moment they make their IP Masquerina and then they make their Promethean Princess and stuff like that. We are able to summon that Phantasme, fix our hand a little bit, and then isol uh, insulate our turn for either the Flamberge, targeting a card we control and setting it to our back row, preventing them from setting our face-up monsters, or the SP Little Knight that they're going to use from that IP Masquerina that they might have put in their back row to special it out and then link off into SP Little Knight to banish something. So Phantasme covers us on that front. That uh, Snake Eye searches a lot, and Droll can put a significant stop to it. Of course, there are ways that deck can play around Droll, I know, of course, of course. But this does curb the power of their end board. Effect Veiler is also quite strong. Now that they don't have Link Karibo, Effect Veiler and Infinite Impermanence are a lot stronger since they can't dodge them. Effect Veilering, their Snake Eye Ash, their Poplar, or their Promethean Princess are typically the right picks, especially on that first Snake Eye Ash, because that means they can't use the effect on field they'd have to link it off and then put it back on a field with poplar and then of course i uh, infinite impermanence is the exact same thing for our non-engine book of moon is incredibly strong against snake eye please take my word for it i'm going to describe you a scenario right here your opponent normal summons snake eye ash and uses the effect to search poplar from deck to hand you respond with book of moon they add the Poplar, they special it, they add a card, they add a, let's say they add Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. Now what are they doing? They can link off into a Relinquish Anima and then use the Snake Eye to grab another Ash from deck and then they set the Poplar. But they did all of that just to get one Flamberge on field. They don't have that secondary follow-up. They need to have more cards in hand. The Book of Moon forces them to commit more cards out of our, their hand. 
and Book of Moon isn't a hand trap. This deck is supposed to try and open one to two hand traps. So if we open Book of Moon, there's a pretty high likelihood we've already opened a hand trap as well. And Book of Moon plus the hand trap should be enough to take care of any other extender that they might have in hand. I already discussed Droplet. Droplet, I think, is just a really good card for breaking boards, and it's really good for going first, too, just being able to, like, imperm for one or two by pitching a Harp Horror or a Symbol Skeleton, especially with the Cartesia engine, where we know we're going to get a guaranteed card back to hand during the end phase, typically speaking. Now let's talk about Labyrinth for a little bit. With Labyrinth, um, they have their transaction rollback. That's the really big scary thing, as well as the Butler being able to activate from hand. Um, unfortunately, there's not too much that we can do in our main deck against Labyrinth. Uh, the most that we have is Droplet and Book of Moon for their Chaos Angel, as well as we could draw and lock them on their uh, Arion. Uh, that is something that we are able to do. We do have the Effect Veiler and the Infinite Impermanence to do spot negations. And Phantasme can come up if they do choose to make Muckracker from the Underworld. However, most of the hate is going to be located in our side deck. Skullmeister is also used for Snake Eye. The main target for this is Flamberge, but Skullmeister is incredibly strong against Labyrinth as well. Hitting all of their graveyard effects is really strong, especially not being on a once per turn hand trap. Uh, if we're against Labyrinth, we definitely do put in the Bestials, Druisworm, and Baldric to get rid of their furniture from graveyard, as well as hopefully trying to get rid of their big mommy from graveyard as well. And um, when they're playing Labyrinth, we do kind of want to side in that Jizzy Kiru just to drop it on top of one of their uh, monsters when they're at least expecting it. When, again, when against Snake Eye, we also side in Jizzy Kiru, but that's for a different reason. That is for their Amblo Whale. We just drop the Jizzy Kiru on their Amblo Whale, and they have to send something else to Graveyard for the Promethean Princess. So they get to deny them out of all of that value. As well as we do side in Nibiru if we think that they can't really play around it. However, this is more of a card for rogue decks per se. I also really do like if we're going second against Snake Eyes, siding in evenly matched since they do like setting a lot of back row so we can really punish them a lot with this card. And alrighty, and before we end this video off, I am just going to do one to two hat test hands and walk you through my thought processes when making my plays. I know you guys just saw a bunch of test hands earlier. I just want to walk you through that process of making the plays so you understand where my head is at. Because I do understand that maybe I didn't give you the best explanation per se. So we're going to start. All right, this looks like a pretty decent hand. We did open Cartesia, although we don't actually have any other follow up for it. However, we are still going to activate our Branded in High Spirits here, although it's, it's going to look a little sus. This is going to guarantee our Grand Guggenol on our opponent's turn. Since we're going to be dumping this Cartesia, we sent a Fusion Monster to Graveyard, so it's going to add back to hand, and we're grabbing another one for our Normal Summon. Although, although we don't want to Normal Summon it yet. We want to go Foolish Burial first to send our Orcist Harpoor, because since we're not going to be using the effect of Cartesia to Fusion Summon on this turn, we can afford to dark lock us from special summoning right now since we have a normal summon. So we're going to special summon that Gearsu from deck and then Gearsu we're going to activate the effect to send an Orcist Nightmare from deck to graveyard. Then we're going to go Gearsu, we're going to make a token for us and a token for our opponent. When we're making tokens for our opponent we do want to put it in the center column here because we want to need to make Galatea here so it's always pointing to something theoretically. Then we can go and then we can, uh, we can't make a Link Spider here, unfortunately, but we can go Normal Summon this Cartesia. Then we're going to go Orcus Nightmare. We're going to target this and we're going to send our World Dawn. And you're like, although, um, this is one of the issues with, um, Link Karibo not being in here. Because we can typically go Link Karibo, but Link Spider is an Earth. However, it doesn't really matter right here because we can go World Wand. We want to bring back the Harp Horror here because that's one of the one we really want in Graveyard. So we're going to special out that Harpoor, and then this means we can now go Harpoor and the Gearsu into a Galatea. We want to keep the token around because it's going to be IP Mascarena material later. We want to return this World Wand to deck since we can send it to Graveyard later with the Nightmare. And that means we get to set our Babel to, to our field, which means we can actually do stuff on our opponent's turn. We're going to activate that Babel, and then we're going to immediately slap a Ding Gearsu on top of this Galatea since it served its purpose for the time being. We're going to go Ding Gearsu, we're going to attach material, we're going to get this Nightmare back so we can use it on our opponent's turn, which is quite useful. 
And then we are going to go into an IP Masquerana using Ding and our token. This means we can go Grand Goganol on quick effect if need be using IP or we can go IP into Blazing Cartesia. We do also have a Droplet set and we also have that Orcus Tarpor and that Nightmare on Graveyard. During the end phase, we are going to get this Cartesia back to hand and we do have the Grand Goganol in Graveyard. So in the end, interaction based, we have one interaction, two interactions technically with Cartesia, three with our, our IP Masquerina, four with our Nightmare uh, Orcus Nightmare, five with our Harpoor, six with the gear shoe that it summons and then seven with the grand guggenol in graveyard if we send a uh, symbol skeleton we could be eight if depending on if we bring back a gear shoe or a galatea so we have eight different actions we are able to do to mess up our opponent and almost all of those actions lower the chance that we die this turn so that is how one of those combos would go and during our opponent's turn if they like we how you want to play this deck is you want to control the game state this doesn't mean deny everything that's happening. You need to be aware of what your opponent is trying to do and kind of guide them to a losing position. You want to guide them by slowly taking away their options. The moment they normal some, they do something that you know is going to be a threat or they're leading to an action you know is going to be a threat, you want to load up your gear suit as your ding gear suit as fast as possible to basically act as your no man. I want to say no to that. Same thing with your Grand Guggenol, being able to get that Pro Skinion. Same thing with the IP Mascarena. You want to be able to say no, although the deck can't say no too many times, you are able to say no enough where you could procure a game state where you are in a winning position on the crackback when it's getting passed back to you, in which case you can just win right there on the spot. Now let's do one more test hand. Alrighty. So this hand is honestly really quite good. Here, during our draw phase to play around Droll, we can go Brandon High Spirits. We're going to reveal the Symbol Skeleton, because this is the one we really want to be getting in Graveyard right now. We're going to send a Sprint, and we're going to send the Skeleton, and we're going to add that Cartesia. We did technically go minus one to do it, although we did send a Fusion Monster to our Graveyard, as well as a Symbol Skeleton, so it's kind of worth it. We get a normal summon that Cartesia. We don't want to activate this on a quick effect. We want to wait to see if our opponent's stupid and imperms or effect failures. However... We can just do this here since it is just a test. We're gonna just we're gonna summon that Grand Guggenol. We're gonna activate that effect, and we are going to send our Nightmare from deck to graveyard. So now we're okay to dark lock ourselves. We summon the light that we wanted to. We're able to dump this Harpoor. We're going first, so it doesn't really matter what order we do things in. We're gonna go our Harpoor. We're gonna summon a Gear Suit from deck. It's a little unfortunate we opened with a Gear Suit, so we're one Gear Suit down. However, we are playing three, so it is typical. We're going to activate that Gear 2 effect here. We, since we already have the Symbol Skeleton in Graveyard and we have the Harpoor and the Nightmare in Rotation, we want to be sending that World Wand to Graveyard so we can get back that Harpoor. Here we can go a little bit early. We can make a Galatea with the Grand Guggenol just to get it in Graveyard. We don't want to use Galatea quite yet because we want to put these both back in Graveyard, not in deck. So we're going to go World Wand to bring back this Harpoor, the one we really want in Graveyard. We're going to put it in the zone and link Galatea points too, just in case. We can go Galatea to put back the World Want in order to grab a Babel to field. We are able to activate the said Babel. Then we can go and do a Dingirsu. We get to go Dingirsu effect to attach a material. Let's attach that Nightmare. And then lastly, we can go into an IP Mascarena. We get to set not one, but we get to set two cards. And we get to pass it over with our graveyard loaded up. Here we get to go our Cartesia to add back to hand. And if we had the option here, since we do have the Symbol Skeleton Graveyard, we'd have to do this during end phase if you do want to do this. You could technically go end phase Symbol Skeleton target our Galatea in order to link it to our IP Mascarena to make sure our IP Mascarena is live and to get that Galatea Crescendo search as soon as possible. That is an option. We want to do it during end phase to play around Nibiru since your opponent can't Nibiru during the end phase. However, it is also worthwhile to hold it in Graveyard so you have Dingirsu at instant access. So it is a give and take with that. But thank you guys so, so much for, for watching the video if you guys still are. I do have one last thing to say at the very end before the end credits, so do stick around for that. But I am going to be seeing you later. Bye bye.
Before the video ends, I do just have an announcement. I am going to be doing a giveaway. Uh, once we hit uh, around 750 subscribers, I'm going to be doing a giveaway for the halfway mark between 500 and 1,000 subscribers. I'm going to be giving away two sets of cards. It's going to be three cards each for each winner. So it's going to be two winners total. I'm going to show the pictures on screen right now. Look at those shiny cards. Not exactly the most expensive stuff, but it's not nothing. Uh, to, in order to enter, you have to subscribe. You have to like the video. I want you to comment what your favorite deck is and then join the Discord. And there's going to be a special channel in there. Just type your name and one, we're going to randomly select two people at the very end of this upcoming week. And it's going to be on there this the next next week. We're going to find out who the people are. I'm going to contact you guys individually and we're going to find out how to get them shipped out to you. So again, if you do want to enter, just subscribe, like the video, comment your favorite deck and join the Discord so and make sure to comment in the Discord as well. And that is how you enter. Like uh, regardless, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you all later. Discord server bye bye. Link is going to be in the description as well as the QR code on screen. We do talk somewhat frequently about Yu-Gi-Oh! and the current meta, so I would really enjoy to see you there as well as we do recently now have channel memberships available on our YouTube channel where we have three different tiers. We have Super Supporter at $2 a month where you get loyalty badges, emojis, guaranteed comment responses, a shout out at the end of every video, as well as access to the members only Discord channel where you get early sneak peeks at future videos. There is the Giga Supporter at $5 a month where you have early access to all new videos about a day or two before they go up as well as all the previous offers. And for $15 a month, we do have our final tier, which is going to be Femboy Fanatic. You get a guaranteed customized video every single month, as well as one hour of my time. Could be for anything you'd like. You want a duel? Absolutely. You want me to help build the deck? Absolutely. You want to play some Hell Divers? Sure. I'll do anything for an hour once a month. But supporting does help me out quite a lot, and it does help me produce all of these videos. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll be seeing you all later. Bye-bye.